Welcome to Complexity Live. This is a Human Current and Complexity Labs collaboration. This will be a one hour live discussion with those of us on the camera and with our special guests who I'm going to introduce here in a moment. But first, we'll take a moment uh, to introduce who we have. Uh, we have Joss, who's the host of Complexity Live. I'm Angie, I'm your moderator, I'm with The Human Current, and Haley is also with The Human Current, mm -hmm. co-host, and she will be moderating the chat and social media that's going on at the same time. Mm -hmm. So if you are joining us, please feel free to chime in with the chat and uh, Haley will be monitoring that. Mm -hmm. Before we get started, I'd love to just give a little background to Complexity Labs and the Human Current. And for that, Joss, would you like to share a little bit about Complexity Labs? Yep. We can't hear you, Joss. Sure. There we go. Got that one. Um, there we go. Um, Complexity Labs, online platform or website for complex systems um, and systems thinking. Um, we provide uh, lots of educational material, uh, articles, videos, um, blog posts, media, and lots more um, on complex systems and systems thinking, complexity theory. Um, yep. And uh, human current. Let's, let's hear a bit, a bit about you guys. All right. Haley. Uh, the human current is the complexity podcast. We have casual conversations about the systems that shape our world with experts, practitioners, and scientists in the field. And um, we're releasing a new episode next week with Tanuja Prasad, who we met at the International Conference on Complex Systems. And um, we'll be sharing our, another one at the end of January on the 31st with Lynn Fisher, who we hope to uh, join the discussion. Yeah, hopefully he'll be able to jump in having some technical issues. So uh, we are discussing for this next hour, we're discussing the topic of VUCA, it's an acronym, which describes a situation or environments that engender high levels of velocity or volatility, uh, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So we've got our expert panelists with us to join in the conversation. First, we have Diego Espinoso. He writes on complex systems, networks, and blockchain. He has launched three blockchain-based ventures, including Web 3.0 Data Sharing Protocol. Diego is also a former guest on the Human Current Podcast. If you'd like to hear his episode, it is episode six and seven. Mm -hmm. We also, Diego, you want to give a little wave? <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi. Diego, uh, we also have Dion uh, Kluta. Mm -hmm. I hope I, I said that right. Great. Dion is an organizational development specialist, systems change entrepreneur, leadership consultant, and teacher. His current research and practice explores the reimagining of change agents' praxis for systems innovation and systems change. Uh, next, we have. Hi, everybody. Hi. Next, we have Benjamin Taylor. You want to give a little wave there, Benjamin? Hello, everybody. Hi. Benjamin is a business evolutionary systems thinker and avid learner. He is a managing partner at Red Quadrant. Benjamin is also a former guest on the Human Current podcast. If you'd like to listen to that episode, it is episode 038. Lastly, we have Len Fisher, who uh, has not made it yet. Hopefully he will when he pops in, just to have a little background. He is a scientist, writer, and broadcaster. Who has, uh, who has worked to uh, share how scientists uh, think about problems in everyday life. He's also won an Ig Nobel Prize and more recently has become increasingly concerned with the risks that the world now faces. And we are releasing his episode um, on January 31st. Yep, so Coming stay up. tuned for that. Mm -hmm. So welcome our guests of expert panelists and to our viewers that are joining chiming in on the chat. Uh, for our guests, we're going to mute our, our lines on this end while we're not talking. Mm -hmm. And uh, as the moderator, I'm just going to throw out a question and, uh, and have you respond. For this first question, I'm having, I'll have all of you respond and I'll start first with Dion. Dion, to get us started, 
we'd like to hear an overview of your work as it relates to VOCA, again, which is the acronym that describes the situations or environments that engender high levels, I don't know how many times I can say this today, <laughs> of a lot, uh, of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So Dion, you want to jump in with that? Get us started. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so VUCA is a popular term used in management uh, generally for trying to describe this new world after the Cold War and uh, trying to explain um, the, all, all the dynamics involved in, in not understanding this postmodern world and where we're going towards. Um, and my work uh, basically explores how um, complexity and the complexity perspective um, can interpret uh, this new world in a different way if we look at the nature of reality being complex and transitioning from the previous world where we viewed um, things as stable and mechanistic and um, uh, in a very stuck way and, and transitioning towards an a to alternative world and living in the reality of the complex complexity and uh, the complexity paradigm. So in short, it's a transitioning from uh, the paradigm of simplification to the paradigm of complexity, where we start embracing alternative uh, understandings of what the, this new world might look like. And uh, my work reimagines the roles of change agents um, in, in, in generally in management and organizations to try and find innovative responses to how we can look differently at, at this and to uh, form system change approaches that actually work in practice. Great, great way to kick us off. Uh, Benjamin, how would you like to jump in and, and talk a little bit, follow Dion with uh, your work and how it relates to VOCA and, uh, and anything else in that topic? <laughs> uh, great, well, I, I work in, in public services um, and uh, all of our work is really predicated on this idea that most of the things that are worth doing have to be done in an interdisciplinary way and they're probably truly complex social uh, challenges, sometimes truly wicked uh, problems. Um, and, and so I, I think it's that um, the, the key challenge of organization is um, marrying uh, complex open systems uh, with sustainable, indeed viable, uh, potentially closed systems, or at least maintaining islands of stability, um, uh, and you know you spread out from organisations into true kind of systems change, which becomes even more complex. I do want to just put in a pointer, uh, and I'm I'm happy to come back to this. Um, I think we should be a little bit skeptical about the narrative that we all tend to accept these days, that everything is just getting more faster, more complex and, and changing. After all, we went into the Second World War uh, basically with uh, with kites and we came out with jet planes. Uh, so we should be just a little cautious about assuming that uh, we're in the fastest and most complex and most changeable world ever. Oh, yeah, good point. We might just come back to that. I hope we have time. Uh, I'd love to explore that a little more. and. Diego, how would you like to uh, jump in and add to the conversation? So I, I guess I'll start by seconding what, what uh, Benjamin just said. I think uh, it's 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 overhyped that we're more complex. We've always been in complex environments, and and so I do a lot of work uh, trying to understand how humans basically adapt to complexity, and and how they have through time, um, and and how how uh, uh, that's tracked through evolution, and how our social activity is basically at our. Uh, our adaptations, our set of adaptations to complexity. So I came at this uh, to from the investing side where initially I was focused on more kind of the uncertainty and volatility part of the equation. Um, and that led to uh, trying to determine what we can do about that and what kind of patterns we can spot in, uh, in this volatility and uncertainty so that they can help us make decisions in the investment realm and then later on in the design of uh, decentralized cooperation, which is really what blockchain is all about. So what I try to do in my work is basically uh, uh, identify patterns that exist uh, in complexity and, and harness them as much as possible or even create them. So it's kind of designed emergence. So I'm curious, we use this acronym all together this V-U-C-A, all together. And uh, for my next question, I will start with uh, Benjamin. I, I'd love for you to explore if you think this acronym, these words, all live together, or and do they have to, or do we need to separate them? Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Do we, do we need to keep those all together, or, or do we see times where those are separate? <laughs> 
That's an interesting question. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I'll start off by saying that, um, again, I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, um, uh, a philosophy undergraduate, um, so I always uh, question the premise. Um, uh, we should be really aware of where this came from. Um, all of the things online tend to point to the United States Army War College. Some of them describe conditions from the Cold War, some from the breakdown of the Cold War, some from Afghanistan uh, and Iraq, um, where I think initially, when this was allegedly coined in 1991, they didn't believe that the conditions were volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, which is, you know, an interesting insight, an interesting case study in itself. But we shouldn't swallow that contextualization. This is this is a war metaphor. This is about maneuvering and winning um, a, a war. So it has a certain use and application uh, in business, but um, not um, uh, always, and it's not always appropriate every time. Um, Rafael Ramirez at Oxford has, uh, I don't know whether it's just because he wants his own thing, but I would trust him to be uh, coherent about what he does. The phrase tuna, which I think is, uh, is, is nicer in some ways, turbulent, uncertain, novel and ambiguous. Um, uh, and I think that you can definitely have complexity um, without uh, volatility. Um, you can definitely uh, have um, uh, uncertainty um, uh, without some of, some of those other things. So they, they do come as separate. What they're trying to point to in this VUCA um, uh, agglomeration is um, uh, a situation in which you find yourself unable to observe and orient before the environment or your enemy, uh, in this case, um, has observed, oriented, decided, and acted to use the uh, to use that o OODA um, uh, model, also from warfare. Um, so I think we should we should bear that in mind. Um, and usually VUCA is just used as this buzzword for from people who have something to sell, in, including no doubt many of many of us. And I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not proud to have uh, I've stood up and done VUCA training for people who who wanted it and tried to give them something useful. Um, but it, it's trying to point to a circumstance where the world is changing faster than you can take it in. And of course, as has already been pointed out, the world is always changing faster than you can take it in. Um, so I think it's important to to say they can be separated. Um, uh, they, they don't always all come as an agglomeration, um, but when they do, it's really about you try you having a very clear strategic intent, but having to reorientate yourself uh, faster than you can act. If that makes sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you for chiming in on that. And just just to recap, you said tuna. What is that acronym again? Oh, sorry, uh, turbulent, uncertain, novel, and ambiguous. It, it sounds it sounds less uh, less 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 dominating um, than uh, than VUCA and comes from a different place. Comes from future studies. Comes from trying to. Um, uh, but I mean, what we're all pulling out of it, I suspect, and we'll we'll see as we go through, is the need to think and orient ourselves in different ways that don't make assumptions about um, basic stability. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, absolutely. And thanks for that little tune. I, didn't, I hadn't heard of tuna before, so that was great. Uh, Dion, do you want to chime in on this? Yes. Um, the popularity of the word, uh, the word in, in management and, and the use of it is obviously um, uh, we need to ask why and why this acronym has become so popular. And in, in my view, um, it's, it's, a, a, it's a way that uh, people and businesses trying to make sense of of um, uh, like I described before, uh, this com complexity worldview that we need to embrace, um, coming from um, a period where, uh, as scholars point to, the Newtonian worldview has been quite dominant in our understanding of our world, how we create knowledge, how we see reality, and how we actually interpret um, uh, the ways we go about things. So, um, in, in, in for me, the the VUCA acronym is is just a handy um, uh, notebook or, or a way to uh, try, try and link it to people in a popular type of language. But I think we need to transition towards the bigger concept here. For, for me, is the the com complexity concept and the complexity paradigm or mindset that's uh, under, underlying um, the need that, that's out there for finding new ways to navigate uh, where uh, the old approaches just does not make sense anymore. And finding, uh, keeping one foot in that world while at the same time 
uh, having another foot in a world where we starting to learn new ways of thinking, new ways of, of being and new ways of doing that really changes our, our, our situation and, and how we do systems. And I think if we uh, try and uh, use the acronym in a very um, generic and um, a simplified way, we lose the larger context of, of complexity and the complexity worldview that um, is uh, there's so much to learn from. Yeah, that's a great perspective. Thank you. I want to bring it back to examples, especially for those that might be listening in on the chat to really wrap our heads around where do we see uh, VUCA, where, where is this showing up in our world and what's an example that we can wrap our, our head around? And so, Diego, uh, I'd like to pass it over to you. Can you give some examples or, or hone in on one example where we really see VOCA or where we could be applying the concepts of VOCA? Yeah, so I think um, just to, to, to dovetail with what uh, two people just said, which which we're reaching a consensus that VUCA is actually not that useful in acronym, I think. <laughs> but basically, it's because um, basically everything, is, uh, most of the things in the social world are complex, they're networked, um, there's interdependence, and, and, and so therefore, this dichotomy between things that are simple and complex is really an artificial dichotomy that, that comes from this kind of Newtonian worldview. So I totally agree that actually ev almost everything, or let's say everything, except like real mechanistic systems like engines, um, have complexity in them. And, and so most of what we look at in the economic world does, right? So, so as an example of, of things that have VUCA, but, but that's because they're basically networks, markets are networks, so financial markets are networks. Um, and, and so we see periods of stability and periods of instability, uh, but really it's the behavior uh, of a network system and, 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 and that behavior is continuous in time. It doesn't have like, it doesn't know simple versus complex. It's always complex. It's just that sometimes it's more stable than others. And so uh, trying to understand um, how those phase shifts happen and how there's different attractors between a more stable behavior of the market and a really un unstable behavior of the market um, is something that is really important and, and fruitful to be looking at. And it's not just you know kind of financial markets. It, it's really almost every part of the economy where, where we could benefit from this kind of uh, analysis, which is really around, A, understanding that this kind of concept of VUCA is a, is a continuous feature of a network system. And, and can appear and disappear, you know, at different intervals. And then B, trying to understand uh, what is it, why is it that the system behaves in this way and what kind of patterns repeat themselves over time so that we can begin to spot them. And I think that's a really fruitful area that people are just starting to get into in financial markets. And, uh, and I think that, so it's just beginning basically. Is there any of our other guests that would like to chime in too with another example? and and to your point, Diego, around it, it really just showing up and that this is a fairly new thing. I mean, maybe there's, when you think about patterns, maybe uh, there's some other examples that we can, we can look back in history and go, oh, wait, there was actually, this is an example. We just maybe didn't have the language. Benjamin, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? I, I can't resist saying, um, uh, although it, it brings forth so many emotions that right those of us in the in the UK right now are, are living through um, a, a terrible example of, of VUCA uh, or, or TUNA um, which is the response to the decision uh, the, the recommendation in the advisory recommendum to, referendum to leave the European Union um, uh, and, I'm, and I'm not sure what I have to say about is creating all of those um, conditions uh, in the UK for, for markets, for people, for society, um, for um, those uh, of us who've come from the European Union um, and, and so on. And so you, you couldn't ask for um, a better example. And what is interesting from a perspective of complexity and discontinuity is that I, I want to make the point that I think complexity and VUCA is all perspective dependent and all context dependent or all, all, all depends on how you look at things but there's certainly a very strong narrative that you can say that uh, this VUCA condition of the response to the uh, EU referendum etc uh, is um, discontinuous from a uh, long period of relative political stability probably in the UK more than anywhere in the rest of the rest of the Western world um, so I, I think that's a pretty clear example. I, I wish I could apply my systems theory to uh, to find ways uh, to to deal with that better. <laughs>
Could, can I interject on that? Because I, I think that that's a good example coming from markets as well of, of this kind of repeatable pattern where basically stability creates the seeds for its, for instability. And so I think we, we, we see this in markets all the time. And um, uh, so in the case of the EU, you know, the kind of stability that was imposed over the Eurozone by the Euro has, has resulted in, in some dislocations that have accumulated and accumulated over time. Um, and so we see the rise of populism as kind of a reaction against that. And so, so, so again, it's like trying to identify patterns within a complexity that are causing this volatility and, and, uh, and uncertainty. Um, and, and, and the key is if we can identify them, then we can do something about them. So how do we go about identifying them? I, I guess I'll, I, I guess I'll, talk, I'll, I'll do a quick one on that, which is Pear Back wrote a great book about, uh, you know, kind of comparing these systems to sand piles. And, and so the idea is that we're, we're always kind of building up to sand pile to the point where it's a hypercritical state and then it's going to slide. And so that means that anything that's kind of an attractor that's stable will just get eventually to the point where it's creating the seeds of its own instability. And so, so what we can do is kind of look for those things, right? And, and you know, obviously uh, in, in markets, it's the accumulation of risk in different areas. Uh, so, for instance, with the with the Fed uh, ostensibly having a put on the markets um, and so, sort of guaranteeing that they're going to come in any time the market slide, then when that happens is people pile on more risk as a result, uh, and then the risk of the market grows and grows and grows until the point at which the Fed no longer finds it politically feasible to intervene in the markets that way, and then we get a gigantic slide. And that, so, so this is kind of a, a repeatable behavior of, of uh, the interaction between the Fed and markets and, uh, and you know, trying to time that is difficult. I'm not saying this, any of this is easy, but at least we have some sense of, of, of what the pattern is, basically. I'm a big fan of the, the sand example. It also makes me think of John Sternum's, I think it's John Sternum, Sternum's with his uh, theory of the bathtub and the, the, the slow drip of the bathtub. So yeah, that's, that's a great example. And um, Benjamin also mentioned earlier, and there was a lot of head nodding around this narrative that everything is getting faster. And so Dion, I, I wonder if you'd like to chime in on that. What are your thoughts on this idea that we have that everything is, is faster than it was and that we, we can't keep up? Yes, I think um, while at the same time that might uh, be experienced in that way and uh, new technologies come uh, forth every day and we have uh, so much more interconnective uh, possibilities than we had um, many years ago and um, the rise of uh, various technologies have uh, just given us the ability to communicate in different ways on multiple levels. It does give us the experience of that. It does not necessarily mean the world is more complex but uh, the way we interpret it might be feeling like that um the world has always been complex and social relations and um all the uh, examples given like economic environment or uh business environment has always been complex the, the question is um uh, we are becoming more aware and seeing this in our own lives and the lives we are embedded in and I and and the, for us to, to start navigating um, the space is is really the question: How do we move into um, uh, 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 becoming aware of the VUCA world then, or or this complex world, and how we how do we live differently, and how we do do we think differently in this world? Um, uh, do, uh, in my research, I've uh, basically identified four interesting. Um, ways in which you could navigate this this world and uh, the first one would be to, to start embrace the complexity rather than pushing it away and seek for overly crawling things and, and trying to um, um, make uh, things in, in uh, simplify things again to, to the level of dumbing things down we need to maintain the the, the the level of complexity without losing ourselves in the process. So embracing complexity is the first point. The second one is navi navigating this ambiguity and uh, incongruence that we feel in ourselves and in uh, with regards to the world we're experiencing around us. Um, so the, um, the various ambiguous um, uh, uh, like I said earlier, with one foot in, in a mechanistic system and an, another foot uh, in our thoughts and our thinking we, where we realize there's so much more uh, that can be done. And, and this ambiguous type of um, na uh, navigational way is, is part of the process. Um, and then um, navigating also the incongruence of, of realizing that the new thoughts and thinking um, is part of us, that systems thinking is actually 
um, something that you can learn, but you need to also unlearn, uh, like we had mentioned before, the mechanistic world and the mechanistic uh, assumptions behind a lot of what we already do. And then um, the third point I'd like to make is to start becoming um, aware of how we are relationally connected to each other um, and uh, our wider world and that we are inherent relational uh, beings and that uh, the patterns and the networks we are embedded in is, is always interconnected. And the final one is to, to as a practical point, um, the fourth one would be that we uh, need to find ways that we could co-create resilient heuristics or, or um, contextually appropriate ways of uh, finding practices that help us navigate this uh, VUCA world in, in such a way that, that uh, it stays resilient no, no matter what um, and how the context changes constantly. Fast moving system or slow moving system or stable or unstable, we have found resilient heuristics or continually developed ones that actually help us navigate the space and, and help us act in ways that are congruent to the complexity. I feel like each of those areas that you described, if we have time, we could probably even dive in a little deeper into each of those and how we navigate that. So hopefully we have time to come back to that, uh, to you, Dion, and then also to hear from others on, on how do we, how do we go, where do we go from here? What do we do? Uh, I know that Joss, I'm curious what you'd like to add to the conversation at this point. Yeah, <clears throat> I just wanted to, um, what Diego said there was very interesting about the Sampa model because um, it captures kind of how in complex systems you have um, these periods of, of kind of stable linear growth and then you get kind of exponential non-linear phase transitions and that's kind of the sand power model. You have like the dropping of sand and it builds up in a linear fashion and then you get, um, you know, a collapse. Um, it all builds up and you get exponential change. You get feedback loop and you get exponential change. And I think VUCA in many ways kind of comes from, it's what you experience when you're in one of those uh, non-linear processes of change, when in a kind of systemic, I would say it's, it's, it really comes from systemic change rather than traditional linear change. So normal change as we understand it, um, kind of linear change is when the structure of the system stays the same but the component parts in the system are, are changing, right? That's kind of linear change. And then those exponential systemic changes when the whole structure of the system change, changes. And I think that's kind of what VUCA is about. That's what you experience as, um, say, a person in an organization, and you're looking out at the environment there, whether it's a market or the political environment or whatever, and it's changing in a systemic way. Um, and that's what you experience. I think ambiguity is a good kind of illustration of that. Um, so ambiguity is the idea that things are open to more than one interpretation. And if you think about it in kind of a normal environment, in a kind of, if you go back maybe 50 years or so, and we kind of had a paradigm, that kind of Newtonian industrial age paradigm, and we have a sense of meaning, meaning to things, you know? Um, and then when you move into kind of the postmodern world that we're in today, um, and kind of turn in many ways, and we're kind of um, in systemic change, and we don't really know how to properly contextualize things, and things then become open to ambiguity, right? We don't understand the context within which things happen, and they become um, ambiguous. And I think the kind of the response to that, um, I think Dion was hinting to it there, is systems thinking, right? You have to kind of look at the bigger, you have to find a new kind of context or look at the bigger picture to, be, to help you kind of recontextualize um, what, how, what those events really mean, you know, because you've kind of lost the context the, at that stage to a certain extent. So I think, um, actually I think the whole of VUCA really comes from complexity, I think, or kind of a recognition of complexity. So um, the question as to whether the world's become more complex or not, I'm not sure that's so important. I think, um, it's more of a subjective thing of whether we're open to looking at the world in a kind of complex way, you know? And I think that's one good thing about VUCA. It kind of does introduce to people uh, the idea that the world is complex and that we have to um, change our organizational paradigm, our paradigm about how we, how we structure organizations, how we manage them. Dion was saying that, um, to, if we're going to respond to that, like if you accept VUCA, those ideas of VUCA, then straight away, 
you look at your organization, you see what well, it's not designed for that sort of environment at all, right? You have to you have to straight away say, oh, well, we need a different sort of, sort of organization. We need something that's agile, something that's networked, something that's collaborative and so on. So I think that's that's the real value of the term. I mean, I'm not sure about the term itself. Like it's kind of just a composition of different different words really, but it does help us kind of introduce the vocabulary of complexity and the need for organizational change and the need for a kind of change in paradigm. So I think that's the real benefit of it. Um, to question whether it's a really coherent theory, well, it's really getting greatly more complex or whatever, I'm not sure that's the real value in it. I think it's more that it really kind of introduces us to the ideas of complexity and the need for change in response to that. Yeah, if, I, if, if I can jump in there, I think um, Joss really put his, his finger on something very interesting there and, and what I was hearing as, as you were talking Joss is that VUCA is an experience not a condition of the world um, and something about the subjectivity of systems uh, is really important here. It's really difficult to discuss it without getting into that real dichotomy of uh, simple and complex. Um, but but I think organisationally, which is which is what I'm interested in, um, the, the the tool for dealing with complexity, as Stafford Beer said in 1975, is organisation. You need sufficient variety to deal with what the environment uh, is throwing at you. Uh, and if there's one more thing you need, it's the agility and speed to respond in an appropriate way at the appropriate time. Uh, and if there's one more thing you need, it's the ability to understand what's happening and, and make sense um, uh, of what's happening in the environment. Dion was very much talking about sense making, matching the response to the context. And that's where it's really important. One of these startups, one of these days, will reinvent a factory. Well, Elon Musk, I guess, is trying to do it you know all of the old forms will come back again because we had to invent them for a purpose and they're appropriate in certain contexts if you see what i mean and if you need one more it's uh, the ability to manage signals from the outside world attenuation and amplification and if you need one more and this is the important one but the final one you'll be pleased to hear it's coordination because as we build this capacity to respond to sense to to make sense to to respond with appropriate variety you know agility and speed we're actually in sandpile style creating conditions inside our own organization of, of complexity. Do you see what I mean? So then you get into the conversation that's already been raised that the ability to shift paradigms and the need to be able to change our identity to respond to in the world is probably the biggest, you know, the, 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 the biggest thing of all in response to uh, complexity and, and VUCA as a whole. Those are some great takeaways too. Okay. <laughs> for one more thing, <laughs> thank you for that, Benjamin. Uh, yeah, and I'll be. I want to pass it over to Haley here in a second and and see what's going on in the chat and if there's any questions there and uh, and then definitely come back to uh, continuing the conversation on uh, uh, on some takeaways that we could be doing and also curious of whether VUCA is necessarily a bad thing or a good thing and uh, and so we're going to come back to that, but. Right now, I'd like to see what's going on in chat, Haley. Yeah, there's a really interesting question uh, about which you may have touched on this, Benjamin Taylor. Just, um, just this concept of dynamic stability. So maybe the the other side of what we're talking about here. Um, it, those were some great points of kind of how to to get us on, on track with dealing with complexity, embracing it, and and um, and how to how do we manage uh, relationships and organizations and society. So not sure who would be interested in jumping in on this one, but maybe that that other side of the coin with uh, dynamic stability. Who would like to jump in on that? So the, the question is um, how to maintain uh, kind of stability given a dynamic environment. Is that the question? Mm -hmm. Very open, yeah. Um, it's just kind of touching on the concept in any way we can. So, um, what does that look like, or how does it show up? Diego, you want to jump in on that? Yeah. So I think um, you know the what we've done is create these hierarchical systems. Uh, all, most companies are that way that that deal pretty well with with a certain kind of engineered stability, right? Product market fit, and then we're, we're just driving execution of of delivering that product to that market. And so we organize hierarchically because that's a relatively stable thing to be doing. And so most of our economic interaction is of that, of that kind of like artificial stability basis. And, um, and so I think the key, the key thing I think to understand or like one of the realizations I had is that when, when we organize in a decentralized fashion as kind of hunter gatherers, 
we were living in a completely VUCA world. Like the notion of VUCA would be completely foreign to, to hunter gatherers because that's like they that's all they live in, right? And they don't have this kind of like artificially manufactured stability that, that we have in our economies. So um, so if we want to deal with uh, with the artifacts of complexity, um, very often we could benefit from from approaching it in a decentralized fashion because decentralization allows us to be more flexible and adaptive and, and cooperative in the way that we deal with with complex systems. And so uh, this is essentially the, pro the, the project of blockchain right now. The whole project is, is not about the technology of blockchain, it's about um, blockchain being an enabler of decentralized cooperation at scale. It's basically returning to our hunter-gatherer roots where we're basically operating as a network uh, of independent nodes and, and trying to cooperate to get stuff done. Uh, which is very different than a hierarchical model. So I think I think in terms of uh, you know this this kind of like dynamic stability and how it's changing, I think we're we're headed into different forms of organization that are better at, at uh, enabling us to not only just deal with volatility but also to kind of harness new patterns of complexity and achieve new patterns of cooperation. So that's something I'm uh, very excited about and spend a lot of my time. Yeah, um, if I could also just jump in there, uh, I think with regards to the question on um, the stability um, dynamic issue, um, that's always uh, the question of, of, of moving towards, um, uh, uh, like Diego mentioned, the decentralized, decentralized system, um, but uh, it is also uh, should you react to, to, to your environment. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, those four uh, points I mentioned that uh, the part of the process when you are in a very stable environment but you realize that um, you, you, you need to become open to the dynamics of complexity and the reality of complexity is that you need to transition. Um, and the transitioning phase can include many things which uh, can include not only jumping necessarily directly into a decentralized system but also uh, finding um, some uh, way, uh, ways in, in, in navigating towards something like that um, which might be appropriate or inappropriate to, to, to what you are doing and, and the context of the uh, purpose of the organization. Um, but uh, to just point to, to the last point I made um, previously in those four points uh, or the principle was to co-create res res resilient heuristics and finding those means you need to embrace complexity, you need to navigate the ambiguity of the space, and then you need to um, also uh, realize how relation relationally embedded you are to enable you to co-create re resilient heuristics. And the question is really then, uh, when you are doing that, um, how can you be, uh, become a, um, more resilient and how can you become more um, open to the dynamics of the system? Oh, I'm so glad you added on to that, Dion. Thank you. Uh, curious, Benjamin, we haven't uh, heard from you in, in a little bit. Do you have anything in respond to that or anything that you wanted to come back before we move forward? I think the stability is a really exciting one. Um, and, and since Jungian archetypes are, are back in fashion at the moment in the eternal recurrence of uh, ideas, um, th there's, this, there's this comparison between nature as wild and chaotic um, and the indoors as, as, as managed and, and safe, which is a really fundamental one in the, in the human brain. And of course, the, the balance between the two is the garden, which is nature tamed and, and constrained and, uh, and managed. So there's a little bit here, just metaphorically speaking, about the need to bring a little bit of the chaos into the organization, into the order, in order to be able to cope um, and that might be stakeholders leading the organization. It might be other kinds of uh, input. Every organization is a, is a combination of networks and hierarchies. And uh, if one good thing comes out of this, it would be recognizing that. And, and don't forget that the late stage and maybe even the early hunter gatherers absolutely manicured their world. They set scrub fires, they seeded the salmon in the rivers, they seeded the edible roots in the forest. So the early settlers to North America described it as parkland, not as wilderness. It was only after they killed off all of the people who knew how to manage the land that, that you got wilderness. Um, so I think bring a, little bit of the, bring a little bit of the wild into the order is, uh, is, is the order of the day. It's interesting how language shows up in that, right? And how we create our narratives and whether that is makes things okay or not okay, or how do they fit with us today or in the past. And and I guess that goes as well to the patterns that, that we see or that we seek. Uh, and Diego, you mentioned patterns earlier. I, I'm curious to come back to that question of, so is, is VUCA really so 
is it really bad or is it really great? When do we need to have some volatility, some uncertainty, some, you know, understanding of complexity? Uh, like, when do we need that? And, and, and how do we even perceive that, right? If language has such an impression on whether we determine whether it was good or not and the history and how that plays into that, what is your take on where VUCA shows up in terms of our perception, whether it's good or bad, and when do we when do we need that? When does that serve us as good and not so good? And you're so, still, yeah, go ahead, Diego. Yeah, so I think I think you know VUCA is is a bit misleading. Is it, it could mislead us basically because for two reasons. Number one is it kind of tells us that this is a special state or the exception to the rule as opposed to part of a system. Um, and, and the second way that it misleads us is I think that it, it, it tells us about how we should be reacting to unpleasant things. And, and I think the reason why that's misleading is because um, the, the benefit about learning about networks and complexity is that we can actually create things with it, right? So it's not just about like, oh my God, the world is coming, it's you know, kind of like we're in disaster mode, what do we do about it? It's really actually like, oh, we're facing mark with these potential markets and we have these potential products. Like, how, how can we actually uh, benefit from this and, and be creative and create new things? So, so VUCA doesn't leave, I don't think, that much space for positivity. And, um, and so I, I think it's better to, to think in terms of networks and complexity and just say, given the complexity that's out there, given the interrelationship of things, what kinds of things could I be creating given the patterns that I spot? And, and I think that it would be better served by that kind of a, a paradigm that, that's, that stokes that kind of thinking. Which leads us great. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Dion. Yeah, uh, I would add to, to that in saying, yes, absolutely. It also introduces, um, VUCA introduces the, and, and complexity thinking then introduces um, uh, the idea that uh, things are neither good nor bad. It's just the, the way it is, that, that it's the reality at, and, and embracing that reality. And then also moving into the idea that we need to develop a, a both and type of thinking um, that does not think in either or terms exclusively anymore. Uh, and that would invite us to, to explore in different ways and think in different ways and, and be more open um, to, to uh, questioning our environment and, and like Diego mentioned, be creative with uh, the set conditions and, and, and uh, the radical openness of the world rather than just um, uh, trying to find new ways to control things in, in the ways that might constrain the diversity that's inherent in the system. Yeah, good point. Excellent. And uh, and Joss, uh, do you have anything you'd like to add to this too? And then we're going to shift into what's our takeaway? Where do we go from here as we wrap up? Sure. Um, well, I guess um, it's getting back to what I was kind of saying before to a certain extent um, about the term itself opens up um, our thinking and it introduces the vocabulary um, around uh, complexity or, or, or make us look at kind of complexity and accept it to a certain extent. But um, I think what's interesting here is how much we're talking about kind of subjectivity, right? Rather than uh, trying to think about this in an objective way. And that's interesting because it's a key part of complexity, I think. Um, it introduces us into subjectivity. You think so much about the kind of Newtonian linear way of thinking is really an objectivist paradigm. I think Dion uh, uh, talks a lot about this or knows a lot about this more than me, but um, it's really a conception that there's one kind of world out there and it's knowable and there's one uh, kind of solution, there's one correct way of knowing it, you know? Um, and that was very much the paradigm until recently and you can understand if you take that into the world of, of um, management and strategy, well, you're obviously going to come up with the idea that there's kind of one right way of doing things. Um, and then VUCA kind of flips that on its head and it says, well, that environment is so complex that you actually can't know it. You can't uh, know what's really going to happen in the future. You even ambiguity, you don't properly even understand the things that are, that are out there. And straight away that introduces subjectivity, right? It introduces the idea um, that, well, there's an objective world maybe out there, but we don't really know what it's like. And it's a lot down to our subjectivity to you know, what that, that world's about. And, it, uh, and as soon as you accept sub subjectivity, the idea that there's multiple different perspectives, each value, and probably the best one is going to be some kind of synthesis of those different perspectives, right? So that, that's a type of kind of approaching strategy and approaching management and so forth in the kind of traditional way where we have 
really intelligent people at the top or even the most intelligent person at the top and he kind of knows what to do, right? Um, so I think that's one example of how the value of that term is, is really just in that it introduces us to a new kind of, uh, a new paradigm, new paradigm of complexity. And I think that's probably the best way of thinking about it, of, of looking at it. Um, personally, I do think that the world is getting more complex, but I, I understand other people's perspective that maybe it's not, maybe it's always been complex. I mean, there's definitely, there's definitely some truth to that. The world has always been complex, but I do think that personally, I do think that if you're the CEO of a corporation and you're kind of are trying to run a global corporation in today's world, um, I think you do experience kind of VUCA um, in a way that you didn't um, maybe 20, 30 years ago. And I think that there is something objective, there's something subjective about that, but there's also something objective too. I think the complexity and the connectivity has proliferated. Um, and I think, um, and that's why this term has kind of risen to prominence. Um, Cause I think you do, if you are kind of managing, if you are operating in that very complex global kind of environment, then, then you do do experience that. But yeah, I mean, just get, getting back to, to summarize that, I, I think the value is in just op opening up our, our, our kind of uh, paradigm vocabulary to, to complexity. And it's more about something subjective than, than objective. Joss, you actually nailed what I was thinking and I couldn't quite get my words together. And, and what is this? Put my finger on what is this uh, thing, this, sub, this subjective uh, topic that we're talking about and, and how do we wrap our heads around it? And I'm thinking of you people that we have listening and, and are involved in the chat right now. Where are they at in the spectrum of understanding VUCA and their involvement with VUCA? And often we just need that language to, to wrap our head around. Um, different terms and, and paradigm shifts. And so, you know, in our last few minutes, I, I want to shift a little and talk about where do we go from here? What do we do? Uh, we understand that, you know, it's subjective and we have different perspectives and uh, and we've approached or, or dealt with or navigated VUCA in different ways. And so where do our listeners go? What, is, what are some takeaways? What are some things that we could be doing um, personally? Um, I know someone talked about it being really, you know, a systemic, um, but, you know, that has to start also with us, even when things are systemic. And so just, I'd love to hear from everybody uh, as one of our wrap-up questions. What's a takeaway? We've heard some already um, from you all. It's all right if you want to repeat those and then uh, allow some time for updates from each of us and to hear more about when the next complexity live is. And so with that, uh, Diego, I'll pass it over to you. What is a, what is a takeaway? What do, we, what do we do now? So I, for me, the main takeaway is basically to understand that the world uh, is interdependent and, uh, in, and interrelated and shows this kind of nonlinear behavior all the time. And, and when it's stable, it just happens to be in a stable phase. And if we and, and if, if we accept that the dynamics are always complex and at some level, are going to be uh, complex actually in manifesting itself, um, then how we approach things really begins to change. And so for me, the main uh, paradigm that I use to do that is networks, right? So I, so I think networks are interdependent. Um, networks are, are, are behaving in, in these kinds of uh, ways that uh, Newtonian physics doesn't allow for. Um, and so I think we're at like the beginning of really the network era. I think we're finding out so much about networks going forward and, uh, and that's gonna be our new paradigm going forward. It's not even gonna be necessarily complexity. I think it's going to be networks. And, um, and so, so much of, uh, of, of what we have to, to take advantage of in terms of opportunities ahead of us have to do with how we work in networks, how we design networks, um, and how we do new things with networks. And so that, that, that's a little bit abstract, I realize, for most people. Um, but just, just as kind of like an appetizer into the whole thing, because I think this is really where we're headed into, into a world where network science starts to matter much more than economics. And uh, uh, that's an exciting world to be in. Thanks, Diego. Uh, Benjamin. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm very stimulated by what Joss and Diego both said, and, and I, I got a little bit of response. And Joss mentioned something about the most intelligent person. Well, 
I'm still going to say that the be most intelligent person, they better be at the top. Where do, where do you want them? <laughs> um, so I, I think, you know, in, in response to Diego's thing, I think, yes, networks, but still hierarchies. That's 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 the point. Um, what Diego said also made me um, uh, remember a good slogan. Always remember that we're between the wars. Um, uh, be, be grateful uh, for, for, for where we are. Um, but my takeaway is just that I learned a lot today. I'm really grateful to you and Josh and all the contributors. So is uh, keep learning and keep questioning. Mm, keep learning, keep questioning, get a little curious. We okay. like that. Dion. Yes, thank you. Um, I think uh, the term VUCA uh, does introduce and, and invite us to, to question more uh, about this, the complexity worldview uh, and the complexity paradigm. So for, for me, I think a takeaway would be for people to start uh, thinking more about what system thinking and complexity thinking actually would mean and how does it influence uh, their, their way of their uh, personal thinking in their own lives and their working lives and how do they relate um, in, 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 uh, or congruent to, to what they would like to do in, in, in their work environment, whether it, it constrains them and whether it enables them to, to create the conditions for change. Um, I, I, I like to think in terms of management and team, in terms of uh, organizations that we should uh, try and work move away from the idea that we can actually make change and, 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 and uh, by just thinking differently, but that we should start thinking about the idea of curating change and uh, systems of curation and creating conditions that enable us to look at the history, uh, find the ways that we create spaces in the now. Uh, that we could um, uh, invite people to, to to join into to create a um, collaborative future um, where where we could think differently, do differently, but also just uh, develop ways of being together in in new ways that invite uh, openness to to the complexity and embracing the complex world. Yeah, great. Thanks, Dion. Uh, just as we wrap up, and I will come back to everybody to do updates for. Uh, for the organization, but Haley, just wrapping up the, the chat, is there anything else you'd like to add on what's going on with the chat? Well, since we have just a few minutes left, I think that I'm just kind of processing what everything that's been said in this amazing conversation, and then also taking into consideration kind of the chat and what people are asking. Um, a couple of things, uh, decentralization, I really feel like the localization movement is a big part of this as well as the blockchain movement. Um, I'm really hopeful for the localization movement. We talked with Helena Norberg Hodge, uh, the co-founder or the founder of uh, Local Futures. And, um, you know, that's another great way for us to deal with VUCA um, and to really kind of think of things in a different way. And then um, sense making, I thought of Dave Snowden. Right. Um, so we talked with Dave Snowden on the on the show as well, and that that's an, a great tool, um, his, his sense making work for organizations who are trying to to figure out how to navigate situations. Um, and then there was a question in the chat that um, was was about basically like early warning signals and how, you know, how do you find those in these situations and, and figure out if you're at a phase transition or a tipping point. And um, we recently spoke with Francesco Filia and I, I thought of him because his work in the financial industry really uh, it brings complexity science into this into this world and and how how he identifies early warning signals so you can check out his work um and he's we'll also be airing his episode yeah in february yeah so he'll be on the show um next month yeah. i believe and then his work is um fascinator capital so he has some great um, complexity science research that he brings into the financial field and that kind of tells you how we can look at early warning signals as well um all of that being said, this has been an amazing conversation. And we do have some updates for the human currents. We have a Patreon page now. So if you would like to be a contributor of the show, we encourage you to do so. And um, there's a link on our website for where you can go to uh, to help us out. Yes, yes. And uh, any other updates for, oh, and, and we have our upcoming episodes that are also uh, being rolled out. So mm -hmm. uh, we continue to move forward, even though our funding is coming to an end. And so we definitely are relying on the, the support of our audience. Uh, yes. We still are, have lots in the hopper to come out. Uh, and so other updates, any other things that you would like to share before we wrap up? Diego. Uh, 
you know, on my end, uh, just just that I will be trying to work in the blockchain world to implement some of these ideas about complexity, and and I think it's a really good fit. And so that's that's what I'm about for the foreseeable future. And also just to say uh, thank you to uh, Haley and Angie for hosting us. Uh, great conversation, and, and everyone else involved. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Dion. Yeah, I think um, a great resource for, for exploring complexity is, of course, Complexity Labs and all the wonderful videos they've been doing on, on YouTube and informative research they've been doing. So, uh, thumbs up there for Complexity Labs. I, 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 I like the work they do, as well as the, um, the various resources on the internet that um, I uh, that has uh, been uh, done um, and the research done by the Center for Complex Systems in Transition, where I'm involved in, um, that has a, a specific view of complexity um, from a philosophy of complexity perspective, and also then the practical implications for, for this um, in, in um, and there's wonderful uh, books uh, on this, uh, Postmodernism and Complexity, written by Paul Thulia, and, um, and also Critical Complexity and its application to real-world um, uh, examples. Oh, great. Yeah, we love, we love some good resources to check out, too, and that's excellent for the listeners. Benjamin, any updates, uh, anything you'd like to share? I'll plug three uh, websites, if I may. Uh, systems and Complexity in Organizations, uh, the Systems Practitioner Organization, scio.org.uk. Uh, the Systems Community of Inquiry, syscoi.com, which is uh, a much less well-curated uh, resource uh, than uh, Complexity uh, Labs, but, uh, but it's of interest. And if you're interested in public services and the application of this stuff there, publicservicetransformation.org. And uh, this is the Public Service Transformation Academy. We're running our second annual conference on the 20th. 3rd of May in London. Get in touch if uh, you'd like to speak or, or if you'd like to attend. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I am going to pass it over to Joss to do a, a final wrap up and some closing words. Uh, as the moderator, I'd just like to thank all of our guests and all the people that joined us on our live discussion and uh, to my co-host Haley for moderating that discussion. It has been a really rich discussion. And of course, again, I feel like we could have gone on uh, and I have a million more questions stewing. So thank you all for sharing your time, your wisdom and your energy. And Joss, with that, I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, I guess we should really do one on complexity management. Uh, that should probably be the next one, right? Because this is kind of, uh, VUCA is all about what's happening out there in the environment. Um, and you really need to kind of trace that through to the question then is like, what sort of organizational structure are you gonna build to actually respond to that environment, right? We didn't really have time to talk, Dion talked a bit about that, but um, that's a big part of it. You gotta build something that that change in, in the context and looking at the environment straight away, like I said, it makes you question the kind of structures that you're using to, in your organization and then um, kind of reflect whether they're appropriate for that environment, whether the hierarchy is appropriate. And obviously you need something to deal with that environment. You need something that's more agile, more flexible and so forth, and more distributed. It's better able to sense the environment locally. It doesn't sense, doesn't have to centralize information all the time and um, kind of wait for a response and and so forth. Those the kind of slow response times in a, in a kind of centralized system, but it's more decentralized and it's better able to sense its environment. And that's obviously where blockchain comes in with uh, what Diego is saying there. I'm a big fan of that mix between complexity theory and uh, blockchain technology and decentralized organizations, and how that technology enables us to um, really create much more sophisticated decentralized systems at, at a large scale. Um, and going forward, that's going to be, that's going to be a huge a, a huge thing, I think, or it's going to be one way for us to respond to uh, these very kind of dynamic environments that, that we're operating in. And um, so, yeah, I think the next one, complexity management, we need to talk about that kind of new organizational structures um, and how we can build decentralized organizations, because that's a, that's a big part of this. Also, I, I agree with Benjamin, the world um, might not be fully decentralized. You know, the next 30 years is going to be a transition period with hierarchies, with decentralized systems, and that's a lot of the kind of complexity in the world today, right? We're, we're kind of in two basins of attraction, aren't we? Uh, between the hierarchy and between decentralized systems um, and kind of in a big transition for the next 30 years or whatever. Um, so that's, that's a part of it. Um, and that's just to wrap up on that topic. Um, in terms of what's coming up, we've got our, our conference in March. 
like two months away or something. Very exciting. Um, Benjamin's going to be there. Dion's going to be there. Um, Diego, I'm not sure. Maybe I'll give you a free ticket. Hopefully you'll join us. Um, and hopefully the human current will join us and everyone, everyone else viewing. But we're just um, compiling the details at the moment. We'll put out a video and more info soon. So keep an eye out for that. And um, let's wrap it up here. It was a great conversation, guys. And we'll talk again. Thanks, everybody.